My guest today is Thomas Andrews Drake. He was a senior executive of America's biggest intelligence agency at the beginning of the 2000s. He was an expert on electronic eavesdropping, someone with top secret security clearance. Then Mr. Drake essentially sacrificed his career to blow the whistle on his agency's wrongdoings as he saw them. He was charged under the Espionage Act, uh, but only last year the charges were dropped. Mr. Drake, thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. Tell me about the program that you challenged, working with the National Security Agency, the surveillance program. What, what was its potential harm as you saw it? There was the very large flagship program called Trailblazer that was designed to catapult NSA into the 21st century to deal with the vast amounts of data being generated from the digital age. Given the massive fraud and abuse that NSA had created with the Trailblazer program, as well as a super secret surveillance program, they had completely violated uh, the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment, and in particular, in particular, the statute called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was the first commandment at NSA, you did not violate uh, Americans' privacy without a warrant under that statute. And in fact, if you did, there were criminal penalties for doing so. And I found this out to, to my horror and, and shock uh, shortly after 9-11 that NSA had entered into a secret agreement with the White House in which NSA would become uh, the executive agent for this sur secret surveillance program. Uh, on the front end was designed to deal with the threat, the terrorist threat, and that was probably understandable. But what it did is it actually essentially turned the United States uh, into uh, just a collection uh, platform. So you know, vast reams of data were increasingly being collected or through other entities being made available to NSA for analysis. There's a lot of debate about this proposed legislation. I'm sure you heard about it, the CISPA, which in the name of national security would allow web service providers to funnel private information of their users to the authorities, to government agencies. Uh, aren't they already doing that? I mean, uh, many argue that providers, you know, Google, Facebook, and other companies, they, they need that legislation to protect themselves from being liable for what they're already doing. And that's why those companies lobby for the bill? Well, that's, I believe that's part of it. The other part of it is the government just wants even more access to even more data. And so, I mean, under the Patriot Act in Section 215, there is a secret executive interpretation of that, which essentially grants uh, the government uh, pretty much unfettered access to subscriber information that's held by those uh, companies. Uh, CISPA would take that to, and, other, and there's other variants of that, would take that to the next level. You know, under, under the label or the rubric of, of you know, cyber threats and to provide so cyber security, the government wants even more invasive access, uh, almost persistent access to networks that are not normally available to the public. I understand the technology is so advanced now that it is probably so very tempting for intelligence agencies to siphon all that data. But what is the goal? Is it total surveillance? I believe if you take what has been happening since in kind of our post 9-11 security world, what you're seeing is the establishment of a sur of surveillance society. You're, you're seeing the establishment of a surveillance network. And I keep telling people, people don't realize the extent to which we're already surveilled in many, many different ways. The extent to which vast amounts of our own transactional data in all forms, all electronic forms and emails and your, your tweets and bank records and everything else are all subject or, or sus suspect, okay, in terms, of, in terms of, of surveillance. It raises the specter of kind of the rise of soft tyranny. It raises the specter of you're automatically suspicious until we prove that you're not. It raises the specter of a universal, uh, I call it a universal wiretap, a persistent universal wiretap on every single person. Or if it's not, they can create one. Because, and what happens if they don't like you? What happens if you speak ill will against the government? What happens if you say something they consider disloyal? I mean, that's not the country that, that I took an oath to defend four times in my government career. And you also have the fear element. Fear in itself is control. And what people will do when they're fearful is they, were, they will begin to censor themselves. So much of what's happening now, particularly in my case, it sent an extraordinarily chilling message that anybody, and I was a senior executive in the government, had a very high position at NSA, it sends an extraordinarily chilling message that if you speak out 
If you speak up, we're going to hammer you and we're going to hammer you hard because look what we did to Mr. Drake. National security uh, has effectively become the state religion. You don't question it. And if you question it, then your loyalty is questioned. I want to ask you about Julian Assange. His WikiLeaks cables exposed the U.S. complicity in torture and other crimes. How angry do you think Washington is at Julian Assange? I think they're extremely angry. The fact that there is apparently, based on press reporting, you know, there's a secret grand jury. There may be even a secret indictment. Uh, they want to get him. And they want to put him away. I mean, there are those in this country at very high levels who have called for the death penalty. Um, and Sweden is not promising. They, they can't make a guarantee that if they did bring him back to Sweden for questioning, that he wouldn't be extradited to the United States. And believe me, if the United States got his hands on him, they're going to do everything they could to put him away as long as they can, or worse. This is a very long-reaching fire. It's similar to what I went through. I mean, they, it was a multi-year, multi-million dollar criminal national security investigation that I got caught up inside of. And they spent several years, several years in my own particular case, trying to figure out how to bring an indictment against me. Speaking truth to power is very dangerous in today's world. The power elites, um, those in charge, they don't like dirty linen being aired. They don't like the skeletons in the closet being uh, sh seen. Um, and they, not only do they object to it, they decide to turn it into criminal activity. Remember, my whistleblowing was criminalized by my own government. I, know, I had also, no protection, although ostensibly they couldn't uh, reprise yeah. against me, retaliate, they did. What I also find striking is that there is, um, there's basically a smear campaign against journalists who, for example, report on civilian deaths in U.S. drone strikes. I read a number of articles where uh, U.S. administration officials basically accused them of helping terrorists, and that label, terrorist helper, it seems it's, it's becoming a convenient tool to brush off investigative journalism, isn't it? What it is, is you go after the messenger, and because the last thing you want to do is deal with the message. You're talking about all the activities, the secret surveillance, the warrantless wiretapping, torture, rendition, drone strikes, and a whole host of other measures that I would assert are extra constitutional. Not only do they violate our own law, they also violate a number of international laws go after the messenger and not the message because see, to, bring, to, uh, to actually discuss the message or to address the message becomes very uncomfortable. So essentially what's happened is that law, which, and we're a nation of law, if, if we start to depart, which we already have in a very significant way, moving away from, the, from being a nation of laws and simply leave it up to policy to substitute, we're going down a very slippery slope in, in the United States of America. Everybody's reporting on this flame virus that the U.S. and Israel allegedly developed to spy on Iran. And then there is the actual cyber weapon, the Stuxnet, which uh, created havoc in Iran's nuclear facilities. We hear U.S. officials condemn cyber attacks all the time, but it turns out that the U.S. government itself is involved in cyber attacks. How do you see it? Well, based on what can only be authorized leaks, which is an oxymoron coming from within the administration and other senior officials. They want people to know. Right. Um, I believe that's the case. I think that some of these that's not being reported. They actually wanted people to know. I think it, some people say, "Oh, it just one makes makes the administration look good." You know, sort of you know, sowing their oats and say, "Hey, we're we're the man here." I they want people to know. They want to know what what the United States is capable of doing. It is a, it is another form of warfare. It is a it is a cyber weapon, but it's a Pandora's box, okay? because we're now in kind of uncharted territories. It's virtual war, to say it that way. It's virtual conflict. I mean, the Pentagon itself has been on record that if a nation conducts what is allegedly been conducted by this country against other countries using things like Stuxnet, that's an act of war. But apparently, if we're doing, it's not considered an act of war. It's you know, information operations or cyber operations. Or, so it goes, it goes under a whole host of other labels to make it something different from what it really is. So where, where are the lines drawn? I want to go back to you becoming a whistleblower. Y you had a well-paid job, a, a top position in America's biggest intelligence agency. You turned it all down. You went to work to an Apple store. I wonder, how do you decide to go for something like that? You can't put a price on freedom. And I took an oath. I mean, my oath was to the Constitution. That took primacy over everything else. 
So what do you do? You're, you're faced realizing to your horror that your own government is an abject violation of the very oath that you took, the very constitution that you took an oath to defend, support and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, faithfully executing that law. And you're finding out in secret that your own government is in violation of it, and then you know that it was never necessary. You knew that the best of American inventiveness and ingenuity could have not only provided superior intelligence, like the Thin Thread program, but would have done so in complete compliance with the Fourth Amendment and FISA. And they toss it all overboard because they didn't want those controls. They didn't want that oversight. Most people don't stand up to power because power wields a lot of power, and power can do you in or make life very difficult. But I wasn't just standing up for myself. I was standing up for you know, the, the generations that follow me. Thank you. Thanks for having me.